Hello, this is Michael Altos back again recording the uh, cardiovascular system part one, which is on vasodilators and antihypertensives, and this is uh, part two of that first lecture. So now we're going to shift gears to uh, some drugs that we use a lot in the operating room, and these are the nitrates. Nitrates are drugs that deliver nitric oxide to vascular smooth muscle, and this little molecule causes vasodilation. In fact, I think nitric oxide was the molecule of the year, according to Time magazine, uh, some years back when its activity was first really discovered and appreciated. Uh, nitric oxide is an endogenous chemical. It's part of your normal endothelial function. It's part of autoregulation to keep blood vessels dilated. We have many different medications that take advantage of nitric oxide. For example, sildenafil, which is Viagra, actually increases the local availability of your endogenous nitric oxide, which causes vasodilation and increased blood flow to the genitals. Uh, nitric oxide is also involved in platelet aggravation, uh, aggregation and activation um, and adhesion. So nitric oxide has a lot of functions throughout the body. The, the chemical is very, very rapidly inactivated by hemoglobin. Um, in fact, this may be the reason why people who have a bleed in their brain end up getting vasospasm or are at risk for vasospasm for a few weeks after the bleed because all that blood outside the blood vessels may cause um, the nitric oxide to be inactivated and causes vasospasm. At any rate, that makes nitric oxide a drug that you can't really give into the, into the systemic circulation because it gets inactivated so quickly. So we have to come up with creative ways of delivering nitric oxide to tissues. For example, we can give people inhaled nitric oxide which is a selective pulmonary vasodilator. It causes bronchodilation, it improves matching of your ventilation and your perfusion, and is often used to treat patients who have pulmonary hypertension, uh, newborns with pulmonary hypertension, even patients who have uh, acute respiratory distress syndrome or acute lung injury. Um, and just a reminder again that nitric oxide combines with hemoglobin to form methemoglobin, and that's something we have to uh, monitor in patients who are on nitric oxide therapy. You can also give nitrates orally. Usually they're given as an isosorbide mononitrate, which is imdur, or dinitrate, which is called isordil. These are drugs you'll see patients taking at home, usually to prevent angina or maybe to treat CHF. And side effects, as you would expect, could include headache or orthostatic hypotension from that vasodilation. But we're most interested, uh, let's just pause right here in case you have any questions. You can jot them down, and then we're going to move on. And we're going to talk specifically about IV nitrates. These are the drugs that we're interested in today. And these would be nitroglycerin and nitroprusside. These are all very short-acting drugs that have a quick onset of action and a pretty short duration of action. The first we'll talk about is nitroglycerin. Here's a little picture of it here, and you can see... Um, three nitro groups on it. Nitroglycerin is a venous dilator primarily. Uh, the nitric oxide is released uh, when this uh, species is metabolized, is broken down, and then the nitric oxide can be released into the uh, circulation. We can use it to, con to uh, if we want controlled hypotension during an anesthetic. It's not as potent as sodium nitroprusside, which we'll speak about next, but it's still very effective. It does cause cerebral vasodilation, which uh, could be bad if it increases ICP or cerebral blood flow. It can cause headache. It's also used for uterine relaxation in surprisingly large doses. These are doses you wouldn't normally give to a patient under anesthesia. But in a laboring patient, 50 to 100 micrograms can relax the uterus for the purpose of extracting uh, retained placenta. There is risk of getting methemoglobinemia with nitroglycerin, but it's pretty rare because it is metabolized very well. And we'll come back to methemoglobinemia in a few minutes. Nitroglycerin can be given through many different routes. It can be given sublingually under the tongue or transmucosally. And these are beneficial because the drug is absorbed into the superior vena cava, which does not go through the liver, and therefore there's no first pass effect. It can also be given transdermally as a paste or an ointment or a patch. Um, and this is given to people with coronary disease to increase their coronary perfusion if they're having ischemia. Uh, so this is people who have angina take nitro pills. This is the nitroglycerin that they take. In the operating room, we give it IV. 
It comes in a bottle, which is usually 200 mics per milliliter. And an IV bolus of nitroglycerin, you should always start very low because people can have a pretty profound effect. Uh, I'll often start with 10 or 20 micrograms, especially in a sicker, anesthetized patient. Um, once you've seen their response, you might go up to 50 or 100 microgram boluses. And then the long-term goal is usually to start an infusion because it's such a short-acting drug. Often we'll see a infusion rate of somewhere between 0.5 and 2 micrograms per kilogram per minute. If you're in a rush, a good rule of thumb is just start this drug at 10 mils per hour and then titrate it. That works for most patients uh, who need nitroglycerin to control hypertension. Some people recommend that you squirt out the first 10 or 20 cc's of nitroglycerin because it, uh, it uh, absorbs into the plastic tubing. And so the stuff coming out the other end might have some drug missing from it because it's stuck to the tubing. So you want to flush through the tubing first. And people can develop tolerance to nitroglycerin, usually after about 24 hours of sustained treatment, which would be tachyphylaxis. The second nitrate drug that we want to discuss is sodium nitroprusside. Here's a diagram of that here, and you can see all of these different cyanide groups on it, and then one lone nitric oxide group that can come off the top here. So this drug releases nitric oxide, but it also releases a lot of cyanide, and we'll speak about that in just a moment. This drug, again, is used for controlled hypotension, hypertensive emergencies, uh, patients who have cardiac disease who need to have their blood pressure dropped. We do see some reflex tachycardia with nitroprusside, and that would be just a normal physiologic response. And a lot of the things that we saw with nitroglycerin, we see with nitroprusside as well, the increased cerebral blood flow. Uh, we may see some... Uh, compromise of the hypoxic pulmonary vasoconstriction. That's the normal reflex your body has where when a lung isn't getting a lot of oxygen, your body shunts blood away from that lung. And that response might be blunted with nitroprusside. And then finally, there's potential for coronary steel. What that means is when you have a patient who has coronary disease and they have certain coronary arteries that are really um, diseased and aren't uh, passing very much blood, then you go and give them nitroprusside, and it causes vasodilation to all of their coronary vessels except the diseased ones. And so actually the part of the heart that was already at risk for hypoxia, for ischemia, is getting um, even more ischemia because now blood is being shunted away from the diseased artery. Interestingly, nitroprusside comes in the same concentration as nitroglycerin, so that makes, uh, that makes it easy, especially because the dosing is the same as well. Usually, we'll uh, not even bother bolusing this drug. We'll just start the infusion because it's so instantaneous. Again, start them at about half a microgram per kilogram per minute, which is about 10 mils per hour in most patients. And we'll titrate it up in increments of about 0.2 to 0.5. A common landing point is about 3 mics per kilogram per minute. That's a normal dose of nitroprusside. A maximum dose is considered to be 10 mics per kilogram per minute, and that should only be run for about 10 minutes because patients will develop uh, cyanide toxicity, as we'll discuss in a moment. For longer-term infusions, 2 mics per kilogram per minute is really your maximum dose. The drug is light-sensitive and actually breaks down in light, so you'll see people wrap the bag and the tubing in uh, foil or plastic. And you should probably have patients uh, with continuous arterial blood pressure monitoring if you're going to use this drug. I just want to take a moment and go through the metabolism. I think this is a little bit interesting and it certainly shows up on the residents' board exams. I'm not sure if it would show up on yours or not. So nitroprusside is metabolized by a two-step process. The first step is just to sequester the cyanide because the cyanide is toxic. And usually what your body will do is take met hemoglobin, and you normally have about 1% of your hemoglobin in the form of met hemoglobin. So cyanide will bind up that met hemoglobin like a sponge. And then the cyanide can be taken to the liver and the kidney where it undergoes uh, conversion by a rhodinase enzyme, that's an enzyme that contains sulfur, and then the cyanide can be metabolized and excreted. If your body can't do this, then you develop cyanide toxicity. And th that especially happens in patients who are on high doses of nitroprusside, and especially if they have liver disease. Cyanide toxicity is an emergency and it needs to be treated very early. Usually the first sign is acidosis, and that's because what cyanide does is it uncouples your mitochondrial oxidative phosphorylation and your cells can no longer undergo um, oxygen respiration. So they have 
anaerobic metabolism, which, as you know, causes a lot of lactate formation. So patients become very acidotic. In fact, they might even need sodium bicarbonate to treat that acidosis. Cyanide has a second negative effect, which is that it inhibits the ability of hemoglobin to bind oxygen. Uh, that's why the classic clinical picture of cyanide toxicity is the cherry red lips, because the cyanide is binding all of the hemoglobin, and there's no room left for the oxygen. Uh, patients who have cyanide toxicity may also become tachycardic, have changes in mental status, even have seizures, and can develop hypertension as the drug becomes less effective. So the way we treat patients who have cyanide toxicity is first we stop the source of cyanide if we can. And the main thing we want to do is not to metabolize the cyanide, but just soak it up and create that cyanide buffer. And the way we do it is by creating more met hemoglobin. We can do that with sodium nitrate, or in the field they'll give people inhaled amyl nitrate. And that converts your hemoglobin to met hemoglobin, which will soak up and sequester that cyanide. And then you just follow their met hemoglobin levels. And you actually want to see that met hemoglobin levels start to go up, because that tells you that it's soaked up all the cyanide. And now your sodium nitrate is just creating more unnecessary uh, met hemoglobin. And you try to keep that below 10% uh, in order to avoid uh, toxicity for met hemoglobin. Once you've done that, then you get the sodium thiosulfite on board. That gets that rhodonese enzyme to convert cyanide into thiocyanate, which gets excreted into the urine. Some people have advocated using vitamin B12, which is also a cyanide chelator, and that would also solve the problem. That's enough for this installment of the lecture. Please let me know if you have any questions, and we can discuss them in class, and we'll pick up with part three in the next video.